would you stretch your hands towards the offering this morning as we pray a blessing over it. Father, I thank you for every gift in this basket, Lord, and I thank you for every individual, every family, every household represented here, Lord. I just pray that you multiply it by your supernatural hand, Lord. I thank you that when we sow a seed, your word says you will receive a harvest, Lord. So I'm praying for harvest to come to the seeds that have been sown into your house today, into these gifts that were given to you today, Father. Let there be a harvest. I pray for financial blessing on these households, Lord. I pray for, for promotions, for businesses to expand and to flourish, Lord. I pray for relationships to flourish, Lord, that there would be abundance in every area of your life because these people have said our trust is in you, God, and our bank account is in our provider, and our job is in our provider, our God is our provider. So I pray you bless that faith, you bless that trust represented here. Lord, do your work, fulfill your purpose in this building, Lord. Do more than we could ask or seek or imagine, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You all can turn to your neighbor, greet them. As you do that, <clears throat> if you could just text in your attendance on the screen real quickly. You can sit down if you want to. You've got about 10 or 15 seconds to stay seated. Give your legs a little bit of a break. Y'all feeling rested? Some of you haven't even got sitting down yet. You might as well just stay standing because we're like five seconds from the word. <laughs> All right, are you ready? Let's stand. We stand to honor the word of God. We're in this series on the fruit of the spirit and we're looking at the first characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, which is a significant one. It's the one that all the rest of them flow from, and that is love. Love is central to everything. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul writes to us this, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I may boast but do not love, I gain nothing. Listen, I've been convicted about this this week because um, in church a lot of times we want to be powerful prayers and pray powerful prayers and preach the gospel and see people saved and see the power of the Holy Spirit work in miracles and prophesy, which is to hear the voice of God and speak it out and to do good things. There's a movement in the church world, uh, social justice, doing good things, helping the poor, and all of these things are good. But Paul says, go ahead, do all of it. If you don't have love, you have nothing. Let me put it again in simpler English. Do everything church is supposed to do. Be everything church is supposed to be. If you don't have love, it's worth nothing. Verse four, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor other people. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Father, Father God, we're here for you today. We're here to hear your word today. We're not here to hear opinions. We're not here to align ourselves with our thoughts. We're here to align ourselves with your love. 
So do that work in every heart today by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you can be seated for a long time. When we talk about love, and I know we talk about love often as Christians, and rightly so, because love is the central Christian ethic. Love is what Christianity is founded on. Let me put it to you this way. Uh, Christian faith has to hold to this, that at the center of the universe, the center of everything is a being who is all-powerful, who holds everything in his hands, who holds all existence together. His name is Yahweh, and he is love. There is no selfishness in him. He is totally self Less. This is what Christian faith hinges on. You must believe that there is a creator who is all-powerful, who is our God, who is Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and he is love. It's the central thing. It's the most important thing. And in some senses, this message is easy to preach because everybody in here loves love. Our society loves love. Love is a virtue in America, especially these days. Everybody wants to be on the side of love. If you're not on the side of love, you're called a hater. And who wants to be a hater? Nobody, right? In America, a hater is like the worst thing you can be. So everybody wants to be on the side of of love, right? You guys are really not giving me anything today. And that makes me want to talk real, real slow. <laughs> Everybody wants to be on the side of love today. We love love. I'll go into my favorite coffee shop, go into your favorite nice little you know, well put together restaurant. They got love written on the wall in like a nice cursive font. Love, we're all about love. Love is cool. Love is kind. Love is great. Love, 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 love. We are all about love as long as we're primarily talking about emotions, affections, ideas. We like the idea of love, but when it comes to actually having to love real people that we don't like, that's where the message today gets a little more challenging. Anybody know somebody you don't like? I'm putting up both hands. Maddie's not in this service. She needed to come up and give a testimony. She'd tell you, yep, Matt has a lot of people in his life he does not like. She'd be my witness. I like everybody in this room, by the way, <laughs> just so you know. <clears throat> All the people I like are in the room right now. <laughs> That's a joke. Don't tell first service that. That's, I told them the same thing. You all know that. See, our, our society is obsessed with love when it comes to the idea of love, but when you actually have to love real people, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where it becomes a challenge. And this is the thing about the fruit of the Spirit. Um, the fruit of the Spirit is actually tested in your relationship and how you relate to others. Do you all get that? Because here's the thing. When I I'm in the coffee shop and I have my headphones on and I'm reading the Bible and I'm listening to worship music and I'm sipping the coffee and I'm eating the crepe and it's the best crepe I've ever had and the coffee's real good. I am so full of love. I got the fruit of the Spirit all over me, right? Because when you're alone and it's just you and Jesus and nothing's tempting you and nobody's frustrating you and the kids aren't losing their mind and your wife didn't say something you didn't like and you didn't say something back and there's not this arguing going on and the people you don't like and the people that irritate you aren't around, you're full of love. 
But all of the fruit of the Spirit only are evident when they're tested around other people. You don't actually have love unless it operates in your life with the people that you see as your enemy or the people that you don't like or when you're most frustrated, when you're most tired, when you're most irritable. That's where you can actually see, do I have the fruit of the Holy Spirit of love in my life? How y'all doing? We all want to be on the side of love. Everybody wants to be on the side of love. Very, very, very few people know what love actually means. Very few. Um, The Hebrew word for love, let me just give you a few little nuggets of information here. The Hebrew word for love is ahava. And that word, um, really when you get down to it, the meaning of it is that there is an action for outward benefit for others. Ahava moves outwardly for the benefit or good of other people, okay? That's the Hebrew kind of dictionary definition of ahava. Now, Jesus spoke and taught primarily in uh, a language called Aramaic, which is a cousin language to Hebrew. And in Aramaic, the way you say love is rachma, and it has a very similar meaning to Hebrew. Now, the Bible in the New Testament was written in Greek. How y'all doing? I'm just taking you on a little language journey. And in Greek, they chose to use the Greek word agape for love. But here is the thing I want you to understand. This is why I took you on that language journey. When the authors of the New Testament decided to write down and use the word agape, they did not look to ancient dictionaries for what it means. They didn't look at the Hebrew dictionary. They didn't look at the Aramaic dictionary. They didn't look at the Greek dictionary and say, this is what this word means. Instead, they used and let the life and teachings of Jesus redefine the word agape. Does that make sense? They didn't say, oh, this word means what I need it to mean, so I'm going to plug it in here as I'm writing down the scripture. They said, no, we're going to take this word, agape, love, and we're going to let Jesus actually redefine it. The word love in the New Testament is somewhat unique in this way, is that it completely draws all of its definition from the life and teachings of Jesus. And when they wrote the New Testament, I promise you, they did this on purpose because they knew every generation of Christians for all time, are going to have to do the same thing. They're going to have to take the word love in their language that has all kinds of meanings to it, right? Love means something in English. They're going to have to take the meaning in their language, and they're going to have to do what we're doing and let Jesus actually redefine this word. They can't go to Webster's Dictionary. They can't even go to the Greek uh, and Hebrew lexicons to get it. You have to go to the life and teachings of Jesus and let that word be redefined. This is the issue I find with a lot of sermons on, on love is they rightly go to the Greek and ancient language dictionaries and they, they teach on that, and that's okay, but you have to go that next layer down and say, this is not how the biblical authors did it. They didn't go to the dictionary. They actually went to Jesus and let him define what this word means. How y'all doing? Okay. Luckily for us, um, Paul does, in 1 Corinthians 13, he pulls from the life and teachings of Jesus, and he gives us a nice listed out definition of love. But again, I want you to understand the way he got that definition is he heard, he meditated, he ruminated on all Jesus said, all Jesus did, and he pulled out of that, this is what love is. First thing he says, based on the life of Jesus, love is patient and it is kind. Now, patience and kindness are also two fruits of the Spirit. 
you can see how from love, all the other characteristics of the fruit come out of, are drawn out of, okay? So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on uh, love is patient, love is kind, because we have two whole messages dedicated to patience and kindness. But I do want to say this, love is patient. If you are on the side of love, if you're walking in love, you are patient. What does that mean? What does that mean? Okay, let me put it to you this way. Patience is willing to give time. Patience is about time, and it's willing to give time. Some of you have people in your life, family members, kids, maybe a spouse. I know you're not sitting next to them right now, but because your spouses are perfect and holy and full of love. But some people have spouses that are uh, a pain and a scoundrel, hard to live with. Love gives time for, it gives time for God to work on them. It gives time for them to process things in their life. It gives time for them to walk things out. Parents, are you listening? Because your kid is going to be, they're going to feel hopeless at 14. There's no hope at 14. But love says, okay, the days, the weeks, the years, the maybe decades it takes, I love you. I'm giving time. The hammer's not dropping when you're 14. It doesn't have to drop when you're 16, 18, 20. It gives time for people to grow and expand. Y'all getting that? It's patient. It's not quick to act on things. It moves slowly. It lets things play out. It lets things move. It lets God, it gives space for God to do what only he can do. But see, we are so used to, I got to react. I got to respond. I got to answer. Right now. I got to react. I got to respond. I got to answer. Somebody asks you something. Somebody says something. I got to react. I got to respond. I got to answer. Listen, the right answer at the wrong time is wrong. The right response at the wrong time is wrong. And Christians have to really, really learn this aspect of love because right now um, in our society, you know, the church is split on some things and one side is really all about the truth and I got to proclaim and speak the truth and that is 100% true. But Jesus teaches us, remember how love is defined? By Jesus' life. Jesus shows us through his life truth the right content at the wrong time is still wrong. See, here's the thing. This is this crazy thing Jesus did in his life. It's so, it's very weird to me. He hid the truth about who he was for years. Isn't that weird? People, are you the, they, he'd heal people. Are you, you're the Messiah. You're the son of God. You're the king. He's just, shh, shh, shh. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Now, is that true? Yes. But Jesus understood it's true, but the time's not right. Are you getting it? It's got to be both. Truth and the right timing. Patience gives the time that it needs. Okay. Y'all doing all right? All right. Love is patient. It's kind. Kindness is about seeking the good of others and creating an atmosphere of goodness for others. Uh, the Greek word Paul writes with kindness, uh, it, can, it could be something like pleasant, right? Just the, the, the atmosphere in your life, the hospitality you present, people can just feel it coming out of you that you are for them. It's patient, it's kind. Here we go. Here's, here's a good one that I'm sure nobody ever struggles with. It does not envy It does not boast. Love isn't proud. 
Like I said, I know nobody has any problem when you see your neighbor get the thing you've been wanting or you see your coworker get the promotion you deserved or you look out and you see or hear people celebrating the giftings of other people. Wow, I really feel God move when they pray or I feel God move when they do this or that. I know nobody in this room goes, why doesn't anybody say that about me? Why are they saying that about them? What about me? What about me? What about me? Love doesn't do that. Love never says, what about me? Did y'all get that? Love never says, what about me? Love always celebrates God's goodness in somebody else's life. If you want to be on the side of love, you always celebrate God's goodness in somebody else's life, even if you don't like that person. Because I know you all, I, I know what's going on. You're all saying, yeah, I can do that. I can do that when, you know, my best friend has something good happen. I celebrate them. Something good happens to a family member. I no, no, no. When something good happens to the person you really don't want something good to happen to, love celebrates it. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It doesn't brag. It doesn't brag. What's bragging? Bragging, I know, again, nobody knows anybody like this, so don't look around because nobody in the room is like this. But there are some people out there who they talk about themselves a lot. You, you just want to tell them a cool story about your family, a cool story about what your kid did. And the first thing, well, little Jimmy did this, just so you know. Or my family did this. Or let me just talk about me and myself. Let me tell you all about what's going on in my life. Nobody knows. Yeah, see, nobody knows. Anybody like that? People who are just always about them. Love doesn't do that. Love isn't about me. Love's about other people. So it doesn't envy, it doesn't brag, and then Paul caps that section off with this. It's not proud. It isn't proud. Again, it, it has nothing, love has nothing in it that exalts myself. Love lifts up others. In fact, you know, I said at the beginning of this message that um, love is the foundational, central uh, virtue of Christianity. But early church fathers like St. Augustine, St. Augustine and Gregory the Great, they actually said humility is the foundational virtue because love has no pride in it. And so if you're going to love, you must first seek humility. You cannot be all about yourself and love. You must be completely humble and have that as a foundation to build love upon because love is not proud. Because it's not proud, it doesn't dishonor other people. Why do we dishonor other people? We try to bring them down because somehow that makes us feel like we're being raised up. Again, it's about me. It's about me. Love doesn't do that. Love never dishonors other people. It is not self-seeking. There it is. There's the center of it. It doesn't seek for itself. It's not selfish. Love has no selfishness in it. Love is completely selfless. Jesus is completely selfless. Why did they define love this way? Because they looked at Jesus. They said, he never did a selfish thing. Everything he ever did was for the benefit and gain of us. Even though we were his enemy. Are you getting it? Yeah. It's not self-seeking. It's 0% self-seeking. Remember, Christian faith holds this, that at the center of everything is a being who is our God, who is love. He is completely selfless. 
100% selfless. He doesn't have a selfish inkling within him. This is the center of our faith. And human beings, the reason we exist, the reason we were created is to represent that God. The reason you're here right now, the purpose of your life is to present to the physical world this totally selfless God. And so if I am 1% selfish, if I am 10% selfish in my motives, in my actions, in my words, if I'm 50% selfish, if I'm 100% selfish, I am not doing what I was created to do. The Bible calls that sin. How y'all doing? To not do what you were created to do, to present the love of the totally selfless God is sin. And I know when we hear sin, we always automatically go to something really morally wrong and evil and corrupt and just, you know, real bad behavior. That's for sure part of sin, but I want to help you with this. When you hear the word sin, when you think of the word sin, you need to be thinking, okay, inward focus. Sin is self-seeking at its core. Sin is the opposite of love. It seeks what's good for me. It looks at what's good for me. It is selfish, and it's sneakily selfish, and it's deceitfully selfish, but that is the thing that holds sin together, is its self-seeking nature. It's the opposite of love that is not self-seeking. In our society, you know, I've been working on looking through this, uh, the fruits of the Spirit, praying through it. And, and one thing that I noticed is that in our society, in America, we have a lot of imposter fruits of the Spirit. They're fake. They're phony. But we think they're the same thing. For instance, one of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. The imposter in our society is happiness, or maybe a better word is pleasure. See, the difference is the true fruit of the Spirit, joy, is found when you are seeking blessing and abundance and good for other people, even if it's at the expense of yourself. The Bible says this, it was for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Now, the cross was not good for Jesus. The cross did not feel good to Jesus. You understand that? It was not for his sake, but he found joy because even the great pain and suffering unto death was for the sake of others. That's joy. But happiness and pleasure are about me. You remember we talked about what's the center of sin? Selfishness, self-seeking, me. And it's a dangerous thing when you live in a country or society where joy is put up as a virtue, but really it's false because it's joy it's joy uh, hiding happiness and pleasure behind it. It's just a word that we use because it sounds good, but we don't know what it means. Another one is kindness. The, the false fruit in our society is being nice. Kindness and niceness are not the same thing. Do you know why people are nice to you? They want you to like them. Do you know why you're nice to people? Why you walk into the meeting with people you don't like at all? You don't want to be there, but you put on the big smile and give the strongest, firmest handshake you've ever given, and you're just like, man, we're just best of friends, and you're nice to them, even though you don't like them. You're nice because you want them to like you. It's about you. It's centered on you. It's self-seeking. Nobody's ever done that before, except maybe me once or twice. 
the imposter fruit of love in our society is tolerance. We just equal out love equals tolerance. If you don't tolerate me, you don't love me. Are you all listening? That's fake. That's false. That is not the fruit of the Spirit. And that is not what Paul is talking about. And that is not how you define love according to Jesus. Well, how do you know that? Because Revelation chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus is talking. This is going to be pretty important, isn't it? Jesus, the one who defines love by his words and actions, is speaking, and he writes this to a church in Thyatira. Verse 19, he says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. How would you like a message like that from Jesus? That's awesome. Man, you guys, you've got love, you're trusting me. Um, you're serving people and you're patient. Like some of the stuff we've been talking about today. Jesus is like, you're doing really good. And here's the other thing. You're doing better now than you were at the beginning. So you're making progress. Now we would hear that and say, okay, we're good to go. This is awesome. But then he says this, Jesus says, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent. You remember love is patient. Love gives time. Jesus isn't bringing judgment and the hammer down like, oh, this happened. It's, it's very possible Jesus has given her decades potentially to repent. I gave a lot of time. Slow to anger. I gave the time, but she refuses to turn from her sexual immorality. What I want you to see is this. We, in our society, call tolerance love. They're the same thing. They're synonyms. Jesus calls tolerance sin. Jesus calls tolerance sin. We have to learn this is the great challenge before us um, as Christians in our day and age is we have to learn how to walk through this paradox of Jesus' love. His love is more challenging. It's not an easy thing. It's not just an idea. It's something we have to press through because here's the thing. Jesus-shaped Jesus love is neither permissive nor conditional. You let that sink in for a second. The love of Jesus doesn't give permission or tolerance to things, but at the same time, it's not conditional. That means even if you're doing the things that the truth of love doesn't tolerate or the truth of love doesn't permit, Jesus still loves. There's no conditions on his love, but also his love doesn't give permission. The love of Jesus expects and enables obedience. This is really important that we understand. The love of Jesus expects obedience, and it enables us to obey. But at the same time, it doesn't require obedience as a prerequisite. Do you see the challenge of learning to walk this out? Love has to expect obedience, but at the same time, you don't withdraw love because there's disobedience. This is what Jesus, again, Jesus defines love. This is not something somebody would just write down as a definition because it's too hard to understand and it's even harder to live out. They just looked at this is what Jesus did. He didn't give permission. He, required, he asked and required obedience. But when there was disobedience, he did not withdraw love because his love doesn't have conditions on it. And his love doesn't require obedience for you to receive it. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But he did not say, if you keep my commandments, then I will love you. I feel like I need to read it one more time. His love is neither permissive nor conditional. It expects and enables obedience, but does not require obedience as a prerequisite. 
there's probably no um, greater illustration or example. There's other ones I could have come up with, but I don't think there's any greater one in our world today than how we navigate interacting with the LGBTQ plus community. You all have to forgive me if I trip over that saying it multiple times because I got my tongue tied a few times at, at first service. I don't mean any disrespect by it. I just have a hard time saying it quickly. Um, <clears throat> but we are at this place where we have to really learn how to love and raise our love. What I see and am a little concerned about is there's a section of the church that uh, thinks the way you raise your love is you lower the truth. Well, if we lower the truth, which just falls into the tolerance thing again, the truth needs to tolerate more, that will raise love. And then, just to be fair, there's another side of the church that's like, well, we're not lowering the truth, and in fact, we need more truth. They need to hear the truth more, more truth, more truth, more truth. I would submit to you this. We, the, the, the reason the church is having such a problem with this is we've had way too much in your faith, face truth and not enough Jesus-shaped love. Yeah. The answer is... You do not lower the truth. You have to raise love. And so here's, here's the thing. The truth is not going to move. The truth cannot be lowered. It should not bend. It should not break. It should not give in to tolerance. And the truth is, um, according to the Scripture. Now, if you want to know what the Scripture says, and you believe that the Scripture is true, if that's your goal, and you don't have any other agenda, you don't have any other opinion, I, you, you'd say, I just want to know what the Word of God says. There are a lot of books out there today written that are, are writing saying, you, you know, the Word of God really doesn't say anything about LGBTQ stuff, and we've mistranslated it, and we've misinterpreted it, and we've got it wrong. And I'm not going to claim I've read all of those books, but I will tell you I've read three or four of them, and I'm just going to tell you the truth about those arguments. They intentionally deceive you with arguments that are very easy to crumble and break. I'm telling you, if you got one of those authors up here and I could talk to them and we could go through the Bible, their arguments would crumble into a million pieces because there are some unbreakable arguments in the Word of God. Because here is the truth. From beginning to end, the Bible's very consistent. It's very clear, very true on this. Any sexual activity, and that word is important, activity, outside of marriage between one man and one woman is sin. Did you all hear that? That's not according to God's design. And so, <clears throat> yes, that covers Everything, bisexual, pansexual, transsexual, all, every, everything after the plus. The Bible just makes it, and heterosexual, outside of marriage. It's very clear. One man, one woman in marriage, this is the only expression of sexual activity that is not sinful. That's the truth. Now, this message isn't to unpack all the truth. I could do that for you if you need me to. But I'm just telling you, this is the truth of the Word of God. You don't lower the truth. Now, the question we have to ask then, how does Jesus actually respond to sinners? Because we're all sinners, which is why I led you through the first part of the, the passage, because, you know, I know you all thought you were perfect walking in, but let's be honest. You've been impatient. You've been unkind this week probably on the way here. <laughs> you've missed love. You've been envious. You've been bragging about yourself. You've been proud of some of the stuff you've done. I'm sh for sure, I know, I have dishonored people recently. That's not love. We all have fallen short. Every one of us have not achieved the love that we are to represent to the world. So the question is, how does Jesus respond to that? He responds with 
love. Don't lower the truth, raise the love. And I've been uh, actually shocked, <clears throat> obviously troubled, um, because I've heard personally um, from LGBTQ plus people, and I've read stories um, about it as well. But personally, I've had conversations with people, and they are shocked that I'm kind to them. Why? Because I'm a Christian. That is, that's the problem. That's very sad and tragic. They see there's this us and them thing, and they see us as the unloving enemy. Again, because our love level is too low. It should never, ever have been the case that anybody with any lifestyle, anywhere, would first assume that a Christian is going to be unkind to them because love is our center and love is kind. That's just like an in-your-face thing that shows we don't have the love of Jesus. We can talk about it, we can sing about it, but we don't have it. I know I've said this before, but um, it's worth repeating. It's over, just over 80% of LGBTQ people grew up in church. And they left because they were not loved. They weren't welcome there. Now again, welcome doesn't mean that you start changing the scripture and trying to argue away the scripture. It's just saying, you know what? There's no conditions on this love. It's God's love. It's not, it's not a human kind of love. There's not a prerequisite on this. We love you. We love you. Patient. Give time. Kindness. We're going to be kind. We have got to get this. We have to have love going through our lives and our church. And we can't let love become tolerance but we also can't just talk about love and not live out the radical love of Jesus. Here's the question. How radical is Jesus' love? Well, it's going to get a lot easier to love LGBTQ people here in just a second. Because Jesus loves people, types of people we never will probably meet. They are so wicked and sinful and at the bottom of society. Honestly, we will never most of us will probably never meet these kinds of people, and Jesus loves them as much as he loves those of us that think we have it all together. Yeah. Luke chapter 19, I can tell you don't believe me, so here we go. Luke 19, he being Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was a short guy. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Now, I want you to recognize Jesus took his time that in our mind, we're like, Jesus, you don't have a lot of time. you got a lot more important things to do with your time. Jesus stopped, took his time, looked specifically at this man named Zacchaeus, said, hey, come down. I'm going somewhere else. Did you know it says he's passing through? I'm on my way to something else that everybody else is going to think is more important, but I'm giving you time. We're going to go into your house and hang out. So Jesus calls Zacchaeus, comes down. Uh, he hurried, uh, verse 6, so Zacchaeus hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they is the crowd, they is the religious people, they is, are the church people, they all grumbled. And they said, he has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Jesus isn't given us the time, we deserve it. Why isn't he giving me the time? Why isn't he looking my way? Look how great I am. You remember love doesn't envy. It doesn't brag. It's not 
proud. He's with a sinner. Now, here's the thing that we miss. Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. And <clears throat> the first thing that that means is he is a national sellout. He's a traitor, a legitimate traitor, not just like a fake news traitor, like he's actually a traitor to his nation. So think of someone who has legitimately betrayed the United States. They have done something that harmed us, that allowed enemies in, that allowed enemies to hold control. They did that. They did it on purpose for their own personal gain. This is who Zacchaeus is. He is a legit national traitor. But that's not all. Because tax collectors also have a reputation for living excessively immoral lives. In Jesus' world, if you're a tax collector, it is just known you are the most immoral person ever. You are the bottom of immorality. Um, you could put it this way. Here is a modern day parallel. Just so you can get, you need to get in the mindset of who this guy is, really. In the modern day, Zacchaeus would be something like a pimp who is also a drug dealer who runs a porn studio on the side and he funnels his profits to support terrorism, Hamas or ISIS. Do you all get that? This is who this guy is. He's the type of person, like I said at the beginning, most of us are never going to meet someone that deep in sin, honestly. We're, gonna, we're never going to meet that person. But I want you to know this. The Bible purposefully shows Jesus with the tax collector, with the worst of the worst, because Jesus interacted with all kinds of people. He could have interacted with the person who has a lying problem. He could have interacted with the person who's just nice on the surface so that you like them. But the Bible shows you Jesus is interacting with the worst person you can imagine. And what does he do? Well, he never once says anything about the extortion, the national betrayal, any of the sin. Do you notice that? He doesn't say, this is my stance on extortion, even though we know Jesus doesn't give permission to any of those things, does he? He's against everything Zacchaeus is doing, but he leads with love. The first thing Zacchaeus sees is love. We have tended to lead with the law. Hey, I want you to know first, before you, before you come in here, before I'm friends with you, before you're in my life, you need to know what my stance on things are. That is not the way of Jesus. Jesus has a stance on things. We can all agree, Jesus is not for, um, he's not for extortion, right? He's not for running a porn studio on the side. He's not for drug deals. He's not for that stuff. He is totally against it, but he leads with love. And here is what happens. Because of that, Zacchaeus repents. Because love works. Love actually works. It's not that Zacchaeus encountered a stance Jesus had and a position Jesus had and Jesus won an argument with him and so Zacchaeus said, oh yeah, you're right. You, you're right. Your argument's better than mine and so I'm going to change my ways. No, Zacchaeus encountered an otherworldly love, something like he'd never seen before, a love that didn't have fine print it didn't say, hey, you need to, hey, I'm in the house, just you and me now. You need to quit the tax collecting. You need to get your life together. Then you can be in my life. Then I'll love you. Okay. No, that's not what Jesus did. He didn't bring any of that up. He just said, let's sit down. Let's eat together. Let's let everybody see me with you. All these people who want nothing to do with you, who have rejected you, I accept you. 
no footnotes, no fine print. And what happened? That love pushed repentance out of Zacchaeus. It's this crazy thing that we just can't seem to get our minds wrapped around, but we're going to have to do it, that the love of God brings repentance. It brings a turning in people's hearts. And I, you know, here's the thing. This message, please, I I know you probably aren't hearing this, but sometimes people hear weird things. They hear things that are not being said, so I'll just put a clear footnote. This is not a call at all to give up any convictions. We cannot give up Christian convictions. We cannot compromise on the truth. What, what this is a call to is to be convicted about Christ's radical love, to see how radical, extreme, and extravagant Jesus' love really is, that he loved Zacchaeus. This is a Zacchaeus-shaped love. It's a love that can reach out to the lowest of the low and the worst of the worst from our eyes. How y'all doing? Because Paul says this, love doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. And this is where, you know, we go through, this is Paul's gotcha moment, because we go through love is patient. You're like, man, I'm not really that patient. Love is kind. Man, I've been kind of unkind. Love isn't proud. You're like, man, I've been kind of all about me, kind of full of myself. It doesn't dishonor other people. And you're going, man, I said that thing this week. I did that thing this week. And it really didn't lift anybody up. It pushed somebody else down for my own gain. It's not self-seeking. You're thinking, man, everything I do in my life, really when it gets down to it, it's about me. And then Paul says, and love doesn't delight in evil. And you're like, thank you, Jesus. I don't delight in evil. I've never been happy when somebody did something wrong. I've never delighted in evil in my life. And then he says, it delights in the truth. What's the truth? That you haven't been walking in love. Do you get it? That's Paul's got you moment. He's saying, oh, you finally think you don't delight in evil but actually you keep doing all the things that are unloving. That's the truth. The truth is we do these things that are falling short of love. We do these things that are self-seeking. We do these things that are sinful. That is the truth about every person. And that's something to rejoice about because Jesus loves us in the middle of that. Rejoice in the truth that you are broken. Rejoice in the truth that you have fallen short. That's the truth about you. Rejoice in it because the love of God is still there for you. You get it? Let's finish this off. Worship team, you can head out this way. Love always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. And then he caps it off with this amazing statement, love never fails. Love never fails. God's love will never fail. If, let me put it to you this way. If we actually seek to embody the love of God in our life, you will succeed. Parents, you need to hear this because there's a lot of stuff out there telling you how to succeed as a parent. And I know you're always trying to figure out the balance of rules in the house and grace for the kids and how do I do this and this this mom said to do it this way and this mom said to do it that way and we shouldn't be eating Cheerios anymore and we got to toss out fruit and go all organic and all this stuff and you think, oh, if I follow that, I will succeed. God wants you to hear this. If you love, you cannot fail. You love your kids, you cannot fail. Some of you, you have, way, you have uh, wayward kids who were, grew, up, grew up in the faith and they've left the faith and you're like, I don't know what to do. I just got to get the best argument or I got to send them a sermon that's going to change their mind. 
God wants you to hear this. If you will love them according to this, you can't fail. It won't fail. Love never fails. So many, so many people are worried about our society, our nation, the election coming up. Spoiler alert, I will be talking to you about politics this year because you all need some help navigating this thing. And I'm not afraid to do that. Um, So we'll be doing that later. But it can all be summed up in this. Many, many Christians think our success or failure rides on who gets into office this fall. We're gonna succeed or fail based on a vote. If you love, you will never fail. If we learn to love, we cannot fail. We will always succeed. It will always be a win because God's love never fails. We're learning and trying to walk out. How do we stand for righteousness? How do we lead people to repentance? And we want to have the right argument and we want to have the right discussion. And we're trying to read all the books that I mentioned earlier and ones on the other side of the issues too. How do we do this? How do we navigate this? How do we succeed? If you love, you will never fail. His love never fails. We have to learn to love. We have to raise the love in our lives. This is the only answer. It's the only way forward. It's the only way we're guaranteed success is to lift our level of love to that radical, extreme, extravagant, Zacchaeus-shaped love that Jesus had and that Jesus defines for us by his Holy Spirit. Amen? Stand with me. Do you believe his love never fails this morning? Turn to your neighbor, say his love never fails. Tell him his love never fails. His love never fails. Come on, say it to God. God, I believe your love never fails, God. Your love will never fail. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what our kids are going through, no matter what we're facing as a nation, your love never fails. Your love never fails, Lord. We believe it this morning. Thank you, Lord. something real quick on that Um, if you're in here and you just have a real concern for your kids and I don't raising them specifically maybe some of you have some kids that have strayed from the faith but you just really have this deep concern that you are going to fail raising your kids that you're not going to do it in the best way you're not going to achieve what you're thinking with your kids. If that's you and there's just a concern there, would you lift your hand? There's just a concern over kids. Yeah. You're not going to do it right. You're going to mess something up. Yeah, just keep your hands. You're not lifting your hands to me. Lift them to God because God wants to show you right now. Keep going. Be patient. Give time. It takes time. It can take a long time. Keep being kind. Keep being full of love. You will not fail in this if you love. You cannot fail. It's not your love. It's God's love. Holy Spirit, reveal that now. Reveal that now. Show them how to love. Draw them in. Draw them into your life and your teachings to show them what love looks like. 